have often said, I will repeat again because I believe it's true, I believe Dean Ornish deserves the Nobel Prize for Medicine. I truly believe that. And I hope, I hope that this oversight is corrected one day. I really do. Uh, Dean is the founder and president of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute and clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, he will describe his work to you, but he is also my cardiologist as well as a friend of over 30 years. Uh, he was pioneering in helping us start the Cancer Help program. And Dean's work, not only with heart disease, but also with cancer, has been groundbreaking. So I am honored that Dean is here with us today, and I want to give him all the time possible to describe his work. Dr. Dean Ornish. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here um, in such a distinguished group. Thank you for including me. Uh, you know, we do live in dark times now, but I think the light always drives out the darkness, but sometimes it has to be a really bright light. And Michael, you and Toby are, are really bright lights, and I salute you for uh, bringing us all together today. And Michael and I go back actually more like 40 years, uh, and those kind of long-term friendships as I get older, I, I treasure uh, more and more. And Toby, uh, I went to the very first Simonton Cancer Conferences, and they were pioneering, and they, besides the information, just bringing together people who are working in areas that were marginalized at the time and finding that, oh, you know, I really drew strength from that. And so I just want to acknowledge you and honor you for that as well. And so it feels especially fitting to come full circle today to be here. Um, and Michael and I both studied for many decades with uh, Swami Satchidananda in, in many ways, uh, but we both have accomplished both here at Commonweal and us in our work is a direct outgrowth of that. So I just want to acknowledge that too. So I want to talk to you today about um, what's called lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine is the idea of using lifestyle not only to help prevent disease, but also to treat it and often reverse it, uh, either in combination with drugs and surgery or often as an alternative to that. And our program, as I mentioned, really was a direct outgrowth of what I learned from uh, Swami Satchidananda. It's uh, a whole foods, plant-based diet that's naturally low in both fat and in, in sugar and refined carbs. Uh, various stress management techniques, including yoga and meditation, modern exercise, and what we euphemistically call psychosocial support, which is just another way of saying love and intimacy. And to, you know, one of the things I love about uh, Swamiji was that he could reduce things down to its essence. You know, some people can reduce things, make things simple out of ignorance, but others, like he can, if you really have a deep understanding, you can reduce it down to its essence. And that's what he did. And so to reduce this down to its essence, it's to eat well, stress less, move more, and love more. That's it. <laughs> and we often have a hard time believing that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they often do. And so our work has been, for the last 40 years, and it really has been 40 years, it's hard to believe, I did my first study in 1977, uh, is to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions. So I'm going to go through with you the research that we've done to show how powerful these techniques are, but to put them in a larger context of, of, of what, in my limited understanding, where healing comes from, both you know, individual and social healing, and then to see where we go from there. Uh, I think after doing it for so many years, it's finally the right idea at the right time because so many forces are converging at the same time that the limitations of drugs and surgery are becoming increasingly well documented. Randomized trials have shown, for example, that in the case of people with stable heart disease, that stents and angioplasties really don't work, that bypass surgery uh, is effective in a very small percentage of people, that if you have type 2 diabetes, getting your blood sugar down with drugs doesn't work nearly as well in terms of preventing the horrible complications is getting it down with diet and lifestyle. If you have early stage prostate cancer, there was a major study that came out just a few weeks ago that after 10 years, men who did nothing lived as long as those who had radiation or surgery, although you end up getting maimed in the most personal ways in terms of you know, not being able to have sex because you're impotent, wearing a diaper because you're incontinent for really little benefit at huge economic and huge personal costs. And at the same time we're seeing that, we're seeing that these, these simple lifestyle changes can not only help prevent, but often reverse these conditions. Uh, and the only side effects are good ones at a fraction of the cost. And so the, what I learned from Swami Satchidananda was to ask a very simple 
really radical question, radical in the sense of getting to the root of something, uh, which is what is the cause? He was always saying, well, what's the cause of that? And what's the cause of that? And what's the cause of that? And there's a causal chain of events that generally leads to something. And the more powerful you can go back in that chain of events, the more powerful the healing can be. And I've been showing this slide literally for decades because it's been a guiding principle that we spend <laughs> so much time in medicine and, and in life in general, mopping up the floor without also turning off the faucet. And, <laughs> And the problem is, if you don't, and, and you know, like when you get put on drugs to lower your cholesterol or blood pressure or, uh, uh, or, or, uh, or, or blood sugar, and the, and the patient says, doctor, how long do I have to take these? The doctor usually says, forever. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, forever. It's like, well, why don't we turn off the faucet? And what we're finding is that the, to a larger degree than we had once realized, that the faucet are the lifestyle choices that we make, what we make each day, the ones we've been talking about. And when we turn off the faucet, what we're finding is that our bodies often have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized, if we can treat the cause. And all these things were thought impossible when I began doing this work, and part of the value of these research studies and why we put so much time and energy and resources into them is they can redefine what's possible. And by doing so, it really gives and empowers people with new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. It's a disruptive technology in the same way that a, an iPhone was when it first came out, or a Tesla, or anything like that. It's not just an incremental change, it's more of a, a quantum change. So I started doing this work. I decided to take a year off between my second and third years of medical school back in 1977-78, and did a pilot study. It took 10 men and women, put them in a hotel for a month, all of whom had really bad heart disease, and they got better. And they not only felt better, but they were better in ways we could measure. This is a, a scan of a heart. This was a newest idea at the time. It's now in standard clinical practice. And the brighter it is, this is the heart, the brighter it is, the more blood it's getting. And so you can see here, this dark area is not getting any blood. And a month later, it was normal. And eight of the 10 people showed that. And, and it was also my first experience that when you're doing something that doesn't fit within the conventional paradigm, it's not always met with with universal acceptance. It's more like, you know, you know, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and, and it, it, it actually disrupts the order that those paradigms uh, provide in the way that Thomas Kuhn wrote about in, in his classic book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. So it's often met not only with, 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 with normal skepticism, which is appropriate, but with real hostility and, and because it's really something primal. It's like you're really disrupting the order that our, our, our paradigm provides. So it was a good lesson for me. And they'd say, like, well, how do you know they wouldn't have gotten better anyway? I said, well, it's possible, but because you didn't have a randomized control group. I said, well, how many people generally get better anyway? Well, that's beside the point, you know? So I went back to school, finished my MD, then did a second randomized trial, and we showed similar findings. The experimental group got better, the control group got worse. Differences were highly significant, and we published that in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. I uh, went to Boston to do my medical residency, moved out here to San Francisco, and, oh, and by the way, we found most people became pain-free during that uh, 24 to 30 day period. Came out here, did the lifestyle heart trial, and we, t we used the state-of-the-art measures, quantitative arteriography to measure blockages in the arteries and cardiac PET scans. We actually flew patients to Texas where they had their PET scans because the best PET scanner at the time was located there. So we went to a lot of trouble to do the study. And all these were blindly assessed by independent observers. And we found that the amount of blockage got worse after one year and even worse after five years in the randomized control group. That's what usually happens is you get worse and worse. But instead of getting worse and worse, they showed some, the people who made these lifestyle changes some reversal after one year and even more after five years. And we published the one-year findings in The Lancet and the five-year findings in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We found that there was a 400% improvement in blood flow to the heart in these patients as measured by PET scans compared to the control group. So these are not subtle differences. And this is a representative patient. You can see the blockage here is less clogged after a year. And because the blood flow is a fourth power function of the blockage, uh, the perfusion shown here in PET scans, blue and black is no blood flow at the beginning. Orange and white is maximal blood flow a year later. And this is not best case. This is really representative of the kinds of changes that we see. And it's to show that 99% of the patients stopped to reverse the progression of their heart disease, whereas only 5% of the control group patients got better. And one of the interesting findings that we found that surprised me, because I, I had thought that the younger patients who had less severe disease would do better, but I was wrong. It wasn't how old they were. It wasn't how sick they were. It was simply a function of the degree of lifestyle change they made. The more they changed, the more they improved at any age, which is a really great message to give people. It's basically doesn't matter how old you are, to the degree you make these changes, you're likely to get better. And there were two and a half times fewer what are called cardiac events, heart attacks, strokes, bypasses, stents, et cetera, in the group that made these changes. 
Now, to put a human face on this, and it's especially poignant because the last time I was in this room was for uh, uh, Lenore Leffer's uh, memorial service. And Mel Leffer, her husband, was one of the original participants in this study. And there was a documentary uh, 25 years, excuse me, uh, 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 three or four years ago that called Escape Fire that included a segment uh, on our work, and Mel was one of the people that was interviewed. So this is just a minute and a half long. I just want to show you the human aspects of this. 25 years ago, I had five restaurants in San Francisco. It was a great life. I smoked six cigars a day, uh, 10 cups of coffee, a lot of wine. It was wonderful. And I had a massive heart attack. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I could hardly, uh, just about walk three steps and I'd have to stop and rest. I was popping 20 or 30 nitrils a day. But then Dean Ornish was starting his program to see if you can reverse heart disease through lifestyle change. And he went to my doctor and asked if he could approach me. He told Dean, how long is the program? So he said it was a year. And my doctor told him uh, he wouldn't recommend taking me because he didn't think I would live the year. So he figured I was going to die because I was in such bad shape. And now, 25 years later, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> His doctor died during that time, and that's another story. But, uh, <clears throat> but here's a guy who was taking, tw just to put this in context, just to make sure you got this, 25 to 30 nitroglycerin pills a day. So you have to have pretty bad chest pain to even take a pill. So he's having actually more than that. These are ones just actually requiring medication and was pain-free, you know, for those remaining 25 years after the first few weeks. That's how powerful these lifestyle changes can be. Um, now, I'll, as I'll be talking about, after 16 years of review, it became, we started training hospitals and clinics around the country through our nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute. We trained 53 sites. We got bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, better adherence, bigger cost savings. And a number of the sites closed down because we didn't have reimbursement. And so the painful lesson was if it's not reimbursable, it's not sustainable. So that set me off on a 16-year journey with Medicare to get Medicare to pay for this because I reasoned if Medicare would cover it, then everyone else would cover it. And if you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education. And we had the support of Bill Clinton when he was president and Newt Gingrich when he was Speaker of the House because these things really do transcend, as Michael said, uh, these kinds of divisions that we're seeing. Uh, it still took us 16 years. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but we got that. It was a, it was a real um, game changer by doing that. And now we're training hospitals and clinics around the country, and two of them are in South Bend, Indiana. And one of the guys was so sick he was waiting for a heart transplant. And you have to wait a while for someone to usually get killed on a motorcycle or whatever, so you have a heart to be transplanted. And so while he was waiting, he said, let me go through Dean's program. And after nine weeks, he got so much better, he didn't need a heart transplant anymore. It's like, what's the more radical intervention? You want to have a heart transplant or walk, meditate, eat vegetables, and quit smoking, right? <laughs> and so the local uh, station did a, uh, a, just a two-minute segment on that. And I'm going to just play it for you, just so you can get a sense of it. program at two local hospitals is promising to undo heart disease for patients with heart trouble. And this prescription? includes no medication. Yeah. Really interesting. WSBT 22's Kristen Bean is here. Kristen, it does, though, include a lot of lifestyle changes. Yeah, but the results are amazing. Right now, the Ornish Reversal Program is offered at Memorial and Elkhart General Hospitals. It isn't easy, but patients who participate say it's worth it. We actually were working seven days a week for probably three months. David Foster is 57. He's a Navy veteran and a retired paramedic. He and his wife are raising a beautiful eight-month-old baby girl adopted as a newborn. But in July, he was told he would need a heart transplant. What goes through your mind when someone says you need a heart transplant? Pretty much nothing. Everything around you kind of ceases, you know. He says you need a heart transplant. All you can think is, uh-oh, now what am I going to do? His heart troubles had caught up with him. He had 100% blockages in his heart. That's when someone told him about the Ornish Reversal Program. Doctors say it's scientifically proven to undo heart disease. I had made up my mind then and there that I was going to beat this thing. So I, I've never really thought about the dying. Not at all. I've thought about more of what do I need to do to continue my life and change it. 
The Ornish program requires patients to make major lifestyle changes. They spend nine weeks learning how to eat a low-fat, plant-based diet. They have to exercise, undergo stress management, and participate in group support. This is a sort of a lifestyle prescription. We're not going to be taking a pill, but we're going to modify what we do in our life and we're going to build our life around these healthy practices so that we can enjoy a healthy life, not spend our life in fear of when the next cardiac event is coming. Doctors say 90% of patients who complete the program continue these lifestyle changes after a year. Foster is sticking with his and recently learned his heart function has improved and he no longer needs that heart transplant. I say, I don't think about death. I just think about the day. So um, I love doing this work because I have thousands and thousands of stories like this and I never get tired of hearing them. And this is a scan of another patient. This is from Nebraska who also got off the heart transplant list. And you can see here, this is a PET scan that measures blood flow and yellow and red is good and blue and black is bad. So this big part of the heart that's blue and green that's not getting any blood a year later was essentially normal. We did another kind of PET scan that used a radiolabeled sugar called uh, FDG. And the cells of the heart take up sugar as their fuel, and so you can scan them and see how many of the cells were working. And you see how much more red there was after a year than at the beginning? That means a lot of the heart muscle that looked like it was <clears throat> infarcted or dead was in, in fact stunned or hibernating, in effect woke up and began to work again. So his ejection fraction, his ability of his heart to pump blood, improved dramatically. So there's a real physiological basis for it. We then looked at prostate cancer, and I know this is a, a, Michael asked me to spend more time on cancer, so I want to do that. And we did a study with Bill Fair, the, who was at the time the chair of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and Peter Carroll, who was and still is the chair of urology here at UCSF. When you're doing disruptive work, it's great to be able to work with the top people in the field because then it has more credibility, it's easier to get it published, and so on. And we took men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer, <clears throat> pardon me, who had decided for reasons unrelated to the study not to be tr treated conventionally with surgery or radiation. So then we could then randomly divide them into two groups and have a group as a comparison group or a randomized control group that wasn't getting conventional treatment. You can't really do that with most forms of cancer. So we could look at the effects of lifestyle changes alone. And we found that the PSA levels, which as you know is a marker for prostate cancer, got worse in the randomized control group, got better in the experimental group. The differences were highly significant and again occurred in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change across both groups. The more you change, the more they improve. We sent some of their serum down to UCLA to Bill Aronson's lab, and they added them to a standard line of prostate tumor cells growing in tissue culture, and found that the tumor growth was inhibited 70% versus only 9% in the control group. Again, in one of the coolest slides, indirect proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. The more you change your lifestyle, the more it actually keeps your prostate tumor from growing. And we did MR spectroscopy on a subset of these <coughs> patients, and we found that the tumor activity shown in red diminished as well as the PSA coming down. And none of the experimental group patients needed surgery or radiation during the first year, but six of the control group patients did. So we wonder what some of the mechanisms might be to help explain that. So we looked at their changes in gene expression, and we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months. And we did this, um, uh, Craig Venter was the uh, communicating editor who first decoded the human genome. And we particularly found we could downregulate what are called the oncogenes that promote prostate, breast, and colon cancer within three months. You know, again, how dynamic these <clears throat> mechanisms are. And you can see here, red is turned on at the beginning, green after three months. These are all different genes that cause cancer. How powerful and how dramatic and how dynamic these mechanisms are. How quickly you can show improvement. And so often I hear people say, oh, I've just got bad genes, what can I do? Well, it turns out you can do a lot. Again, not to blame, but to empower. Because if, if it's all in your genes, what can you do? Uh, when I began, I, I began working with President Clinton back in 1993, but seven years ago when his bypass is clogged up, I saw this uh, press conference that his cardiologist said, oh, it was all in his genes and his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And I, I, I knew better because I've been working with him for so long. And I sent him an email and I said, you know, it had everything to do with it, not to blame but to empower. Because if, if it's all in your genes, you're, you're just a victim and you're not a victim. You're the most powerful guys on the planet. So we met and he began going on the, this program. He's been following it really strictly now for the last seven years and doing well. So knowing that our genes are not our fate is actually a very empowering realization. Uh, meditation alone has been shown to uh, change gene expression. This is a study that, uh, uh, that Jeff Dusek did at Harvard where he found that compared to non-meditators, people taught to meditate for eight weeks and long-term meditators. You see how it goes from red to kind of green to green and vice versa here. 
that just meditation alone can change your gene expression, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes. Again, and the more you do it, the more you, you improve. So our genes are a predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. And this was found, um, we did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who again, uh, top person in the field, won the Nobel Prize six years ago for her pioneering work on telomeres. And telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes that regulate aging. As we get older, they get shorter. As our telomeres get shorter, our life gets shorter. And she did a pioneering study with Alyssa Apple, and they have a wonderful new best-selling book out, by the way, <clears throat> that just came out a few weeks ago. And they found that women who were under chronic emotional stress because they were caregivers of, of either parents with Alzheimer's or kids with autism, the longer they felt stressed and the more stressed they felt, the shorter their telomeres were. And they found that comparing the high stress versus the low stress women was the, the stress shortened their life by nine to 17 years, not a subtle difference. But what I found even more interesting was that it wasn't a, <clears throat> a function of how, of the environment, it was a function of the women's perception of the environment. In other words, you could have two women who are in very similar life situations and one was coping with it and it didn't affect them as much. So even when we can't change our environment, we can change how we react to it through using these same kinds of techniques. So it's the perception of stress. If you feel stressed, you are stressed. So we did a study uh, with Dr. Blackburn, and we found that after only three months, the enzyme, the telomerase, uh, increased by 30%. And after five years, we found that we could actually lengthen telomeres compared, uh, they got 10% longer in the group that went through our program compared to getting shorter, which is what usually happens in the control group, by about 10%. Uh, it's still the only control study showing that any intervention can actually lengthen telomeres. If this was drug X, it'd be a multi-billion dollar drug. But it's, and it wasn't like there was one set of lifestyle recommendations for heart disease and a different one for cancer or for diabetes or your genes or your telomeres or whatever. It's the same lifestyle program for all of these things. And even though we talk a little about personalized medicine, if you're trying to come up with a new targeted gene therapy for a particular pancreatic tumor cell type, that's awesome. But for general recommendations, it's, this is it. You know, it's not like you have to personalize it. It's, it is what it is. And here again, we found the more people change their lifestyle, the longer their telomeres got. We're about to publish the first study. Again, the more diseases we look at, the more re reasons we find how powerful these lifestyle changes can be. And the more biological mechanisms, the more reasons we have to explain why they work as well and how quickly they can work. So angiogenesis, when tumors grow, they secrete substances like VEGF that stimulate blood vessels to grow to feed the tumor because the tumors grow so quickly they generally outstrip the blood supply. And the drugs that can downregulate that, like Avastin, but they're like $100,000 a year per person. So each of these curves represent a patient, and red is the control group and blue is the experimental group. So you can see we downregulated VEGF comparable to what you get with these drugs, but without the costs. And again, the only side effects are good ones. And we upregulated two inhibitors of angiogenesis. So it's not that you need to memorize or re remember all this stuff, but just the more mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple lifestyle changes are so powerful and how quickly they can, they can improve. And again, it was the same lifestyle for all of these things. Now, I want to just take a moment to say what we've learned that enables people to make sustainable changes. And it's not, I was trained to try to scare people into changing, you know, as a doctor. Uh, and this has political overtones, too. So I'm just going to start with that fear is not a, a sustainable motivator in, in any aspect of life, and but particularly if you're trying to change someone's lifestyle. It's great for a month or two. You know, if you've had a heart attack, you do pretty much anything your doctor or nurse says for like a month or two. And then you stop doing it because... Fear is not a sustainable motivator. What's sustainable is if it's fun, if you feel like you're freely choosing to do it, if, you, if it makes you feel good, and if you had a love, love and support. Those are really the key elements of that. And also, even more than being healthy, people want to feel free and in control. And as soon as I tell somebody, eat this and don't eat that, and do this and don't do that, they immediately want to do the opposite. And that goes back to the first uh, uh, dietary intervention, you know, when God said, don't eat the apple. Uh, and that didn't go so well. Uh, uh, and that was God talking, so we're not going to do better than that. And if I have a 16-year-old son, and if you tell a 16-year-old kid that something is bad for them or dangerous, that just makes it cool. You know, that's why motorcycles are cool, because they're dangerous. So it's not only helpful, not helpful, it's actually counterproductive if you try to use fear to get a, a teenager to change. I love this cartoon. She says, I, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell. Uh, <laughs> now... The idea, most doctors will tell you that, oh, I can get my patients to take their Lipitor, but there's no way they're going to change their lifestyle. And yet, if you really look at the evidence, half to two-thirds of people prescribed statin drugs like Lipitor are not taking them just four to six months later, even if someone else pays for them, even if they don't have side effects, 
although they often do, and, uh, and, and they're of proven value with people who got documented heart disease, and yet most people aren't taking them. And you say, well, why is that? And the answer is because they're fear-based, even though we don't usually think of it that way. It's like, take this pill, the doctor tells the patient, not gonna make you feel better, hopefully it won't make you feel worse, prevent something really awful from happening years down the road, that, like a heart attack or stroke that you don't wanna think about, so you don't think about it, so you stop taking it. But the paradox is we're getting 85 to 90% adherence. Our program is nine weeks long. A year later, 85 to 90% of the people are following it. It's a lot harder than taking a pill. And say, so, well, why is that? And the answer is because the pill doesn't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And, you know, um, when, and also we give people a lot of love and support. When people feel loved and cared for, they're much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life-enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. You know, there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy unless you get something back that's better and quickly. I mean, we're all here, it's a beautiful day out. You know, it could be doing a thousand different things. Hopefully it's worth your time here, but we're always making these choices. And again, because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, when people make these changes, they generally feel so much better so quickly, it completely reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. This is a guy in the, we all, one of the sites we've trained is at UCLA, and there's a guy who went through our program in the LAPD, the LA Police Department, and after nine weeks, you can see this 60 or 70% blockage was only 20% clogged, just after nine weeks. Again, those, decades take block, those blockages take decades to build up, and yet how quickly we can show improvement. When you eat healthier, when you manage stress, when you exercise, when you love more, your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep. You can actually grow so many new brain neurons through a process called neurogenesis in just two or three months, your brain gets bigger. That was thought impossible just a few years ago. And particularly those parts of your brain you want to get bigger, like your hippocampus that controls memory. So you start to, like, what was that person's name? And where did I leave my keys? That gets better. Uh, just walking for a half an hour a day can cause so much neurogenesis, your brain can get bigger. Uh, some of my favorite foods, like, like uh, chocolate and tea and blueberries, increase neurogenesis, whereas what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. Saturated fat, uh, sugar, and nicotine are bad for it. Even, believe it or not, cannabinoids are, are good for your brain. I'm just the messenger here. Um, what were we just talking? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Even sex increases neurogenesis. And I just put this up there because so often I get pegged as like the ascetic, you know, guy. And it's like, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer? You know, you have to give up all the stuff that's fun doing. And what I want to talk about at the end of this is that this is how you live a joyful life. You know, you can actually have more fun by doing these things. We have this, you know, false uh, choices there. Uh, just, you know, fish oil or flaxseed oil, the omega-3 fatty acids can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 60%. You know, there are no good drugs for either treating or preventing Alzheimer's. If Merck came out with a drug that could reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 60%, everybody over 55 would be told to take it. This is just omega-3s. And we did a pilot study with uh, Dale Bredesen at UCLA. Uh, and we took 10 men and women, he took 10 men and women who had early to moderate Alzheimer's, put them through a version of this program, and nine of the 10 showed significant improvement in their cognitive function in just 60 to 90 days. So we've designed, I've designed a, a randomized trial and the people at UCSF have agreed to work with me. We're trying to raise the money now uh, to do that. But I'm sure that we can show for the first time that these same lifestyle changes can actually reverse the cognitive decline and reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease, which is kind of a cool thing, especially as our population gets older. When you change your lifestyle, your skin gets more blood. You don't age as quickly. Christy Turlington, the supermodel's father, died of uh, lung cancer. She has a wonderful website called smokingisugly.com because nicotine constricts your arteries. When your heart, it's a heart attack, your brain is stroke, but in your face it makes you wrinkle and look 10 or 20 years older than you are. And the Department of Health Services had these wonderful billboards because it turns out it also constricts your, the blood to your sexual organs. It's the anti-Viagra. And so they came up with these billboards like this. Um, <laughs> It doesn't say heart attack, lung cancer, emphysema. Those are the fear-based approach. Because if you tell somebody smoking is dangerous, as I mentioned, that makes it cool. If you say it makes you ugly and impotent, that's not cool, and that's much more uh, sustainable. Our diet was rated number one for heart health every year, that, uh, including a few weeks ago that US News has been doing that, which is just a nice uh, validation. And there are other things beyond just the personal I want to focus on here, that what's good for you is good for the planet. You know, what's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And it's so easy to, you know, feel overwhelmed, like, what can I do? I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum uh, with my wife, Anne, last week, and we did a two, three-hour workshops on our work. I mean, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Things are really, with all the darkness, it's really important 
important to focus on the good things that are happening too. And one of the things, uh, you know, Davos is all about globalization, and I came up with this term globalization of illness, that, you know, we're starting to, other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us and now die like us. And in one generation, countries like China, and in fact, most of the world, has gone from the lowest rates to the highest rates of heart disease and diabetes, and it's completely preventable. Um, and more people are dying today of heart disease and diabetes throughout the world than AIDS, CB, and malaria combined. And it's diverting a lot of precious resources away from things that really do require drugs, like AIDS, CB, and malaria, to things that can be largely prevented or reversed by changing lifestyle. And again, what's good for you is good for the planet. And it imbues those choices with meaning. Because, you know, so often people say, well, what can I do? You know, we've got you know, the, the energy crisis, the uh, global warming crisis, and the healthcare crisis, what can I do as one person? It just feels overwhelming. And I think that's part of how darkness works, is they just make you feel paralyzed and powerless. Like, what can I do? Well, you, just something as primal as what you put in your mouth every day actually makes a difference. Because it turns out that 20% of the energy that we uh, burn every year, the fossil fuels, is to process food to make it unhealthy. <clears throat> so when you stop buying those foods, then they'll stop making them. <clears throat> Pardon me, and it takes 10 times more energy to eat a meat-based diet than a plant-based diet. There's enough food, Swami Satchananda used to always say, there's enough food to feel like, feed everybody. If, if just, if people, not that everybody needs to be vegan, but if you just had a meatless Monday, you suddenly realize, oh, well, I'm helping myself because I'm not eating a lot of junk, but I'm also freeing up resources that uh, can, can feed hungry people if I do this on a regular basis. And it's not only good for you, it's good for the planet. It turns out that more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. I used to get into discussions with Al Gore about this. I said, it's great to drive a small car, but you know, what you eat is really important. And you know, two years ago, he became a vegan, even though he's a cattle rancher. Again, a great example, a great light in the darkness, if you will. From a health crisis, 86% uh, of the $3 trillion that we spend every year on healthcare goes for uh, chronic diseases, which are largely preventable or, or even reversible uh, through changing lifestyle. That would free up a huge amount of resources. This is one of many studies. Just walking a half an hour a day, not smoking, eating a reasonably healthy diet, and keeping a healthy weight, prevented 93% of diabetes. <clears throat> Already heart, I mean, um, Half of the American population today is diabetic or pre-diabetic. It's completely preventable. For, and this is an under, understatement, you know. I'd say like at least 98 to 99% of diabetes, 98 to 90% of heart disease is preventable today, knowing what we know now. We just need to put these things into practice. And it's not all or nothing. The more you change, the more you improve at any age. So if you're trying to reverse conditions, that's the pound of cure. You really need to make big changes, but otherwise, it's a spectrum of choices. And so <clears throat> part of what I've learned is that um, as soon as you call, I mean, the whole language of behavioral change has this kind of moralistic, judgmental quality. You know, I can't go out to dinner without someone either apologizing for what they're eating or commenting what I'm eating. You know, it's like I say, you know, you're forgiven. It's not, not the food police. But, you know, I cheated on my diet. Once you call foods good or bad, it's a very small step to saying I'm a bad person because I eat bad food and then might as well just eat whatever you want because, you know, you're a bad person, right? Um, <laughs> And so, and then you have all that shame and guilt and anger and humiliation. And diets, you know, if you go on a diet, sooner or later going to go off it because diets are all about what you can't have and what you must do. And people don't like to feel controlled. And then when you go off it, then you feel like you failed and you have all that shame and guilt and anger and humiliation, which really are bad for you. So instead of doing that, I, and I, I shared Google Health with Marissa Meyer uh, 10 years ago, and we were trying to come up with all these algorithms to personalize the diet. And I said, look, let's make it really simple. Instead of me telling people what they should do, let them tell me what they want to do. And the more you change, the more you improve. And instead of calling foods good or bad, say foods are just foods. Some of them are healthier than others. So I categorize foods in group one, the healthiest, group five, the least healthy. And what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. So if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you're bad or you failed. Just eat healthier the next. You don't have time to exercise one day, do a little more the next. You don't have time to meditate for an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you have, there's a corresponding benefit. And then we'll track it. And if that degree is enough to accomplish your goals, great. If not, you can do more. It's just really radically simple in that way. Um, we've done three demonstration projects looking at the cost savings. The first was with Mutual of Omaha. We found most people were able to avoid uh, stents or angioplasties or bypass surgery, and they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. And that's important because so often say, why should we spend our money today for some future benefit that some other company is going to get if it takes years to see the benefit? And it's because you see it in the first year. We did a study with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield where they found they were able to um, cut their costs in half in the first year. Uh, and but when they looked at the number of patients that uh, uh, that they'd spent at least $25,000 on in the preceding year, they cut their costs by 400%. 
Uh, Medicare is now covering our program, as I mentioned. It's a team approach with uh, a doctor, nurse, yoga teacher, exercise physiologist, dietitian, and psychologist. People come twice a week for nine weeks for four hours at a time, as opposed to seeing a patient for eight minutes. Uh, it's really transformative. And it's, uh, it's changing uh, medical practice and medical education. It also allows us to get to the roots of why we went into medicine in the first place. And, but I, for me, it's a Trojan horse. It's a conspiracy of love. It allows us to talk about how people can use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming their lives. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about, I'm just going to take about six minutes to do this, is that um, study after study have shown that the real epidemic in our culture isn't just heart disease or diabetes. It's loneliness and depression. And people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. And in my limited understanding, the deepest roots of healing, even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. Yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that when you bring people together, it's healing. When you separate them, it creates illness and suffering, whether it's on a personal level or as we're seeing now on a social level. And clearly, information is not enough. If it were, nobody would smoke. It's not like people don't know any better. So, but you have to say, why do you smoke? And people say things to me like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes, and they're always there for me, and nobody else is. Are you going to take away my 20 friends? Or food fills that void. Or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain. Or alcohol, other drugs numb the pain. Or working all the time numbs the pain. Or video games, whatever. So we can't just focus on the behavior or the information. We have to look at the, the deeper levels, which are really spiritual levels. Uh, six months after a heart attack, those that were depressed were four times more likely to be dead than those who weren't, independent of their cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, and other factors like that. When you're depressed, your immune system is depressed in all the ways we can measure. Um, on the other hand, uh, Sheldon Cohen found that uh, he did a study where he actually got people, I don't know how he did this, to let them drip cold virus, rhinovirus in their nose. They all got infected, but not everybody got sick. And the more loving relationships you had, the less likely you were to get sick, even though you're infected. So it's not just the, the germ you walk into, it's how your body interacts with that. People who are HIV positive or depressed are more than double the likelihood of getting AIDS and dying from it than those who aren't. Um, in the military, more... Uh, uh, people have died from suicide than in combat the last 20 years. And I've given the uh, matriculation of this place called the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where they train all the, the elite of the elite, the generals and future joints of chiefs of staff from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard. Um, and I'm going to show you this, this uh, video at the end. It's about two and a half minutes long, but I just want to make sure I have time to get through everything else. I'll come back to this. Um, it's really cool. But the idea is that love is more powerful than fear, as, as Michael and, and Toby were talking about. Uh, that, uh, and, and that really, uh, whether it's in the military, whether it's in our society, whether it's an individual, uh, Duke found that uh, after five years, those that were unmarried and didn't have a close confidant were three times as likely to die as those who either married or who had a confidant. Intimacy is healing. We've trained the St. Vincent Paul homeless shelter in our program. Over 30,000 homeless people have gone through it. So this idea this is just for affluent, educated people is not true. Uh, Nicholas Christakis at Harvard found that we are so interconnected that if your friends are obese, you're 45% more likely to be. If it's your friend's friend, it's 25%. And if it's your friend's friend's friend, you're 10% more likely to be obese, even if you've never met them. That's how interconnected we are. <laughs> and it's not just heart disease. It's pretty much everything, including depression. So we harness that interconnectedness, that intimacy. David Spiegel did a classic study, which uh, one of the Simon conferences was based on years ago, that women with metastatic breast cancer who had a loving support group once a week for a year, five years later, live twice as long. You know, and, and somebody might say, oh, give me a break. You mean talking about my feelings is going to help me live longer if I've got cancer? Please. But they do. That's what the data show. We are touchy-feely creatures. We are creatures of community. And we can harness that. And anything that intimacy is healing, but you can only be intimate to the degree you can open your heart and be vulnerable. And you can only do that to the degree you're trusting. And so when you can be in an environment, which we do at, at, in our work and what Michael has been doing at Commonweal and the Cancer Help Groups, create a safe environment, it becomes sacred, to talk about just let your emotional defenses down and just be open and authentic is powerfully, transformatively healing. Uh, I'm just going to skip through. Um, and to me, real spiritual teachers are the ones who teach that. They, it's they, they know how to live a joyful life. You know, Swami Satchitananda had a lot of fun. You know, he was always, you know, enjoying himself. And it was a great example. The, the Dalai Lama, you know, uh, says, my religion is happiness. Or, you know, be kind whenever possible. It's always possible. The point is, is that to me, these spiritual traditions teach us how to live a joyful life. It's not just how to live longer. You know, the ancient Swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns didn't do these things to unclog their arteries or make their 
tumor shrink. It was, this is how you live a joyful, fun life. And, and that's what I want to keep coming back to. This is a study that the one emotion that's super toxic if you've got in heart disease is chronic hostility. All this other stuff is really not nearly as important. Uh, there was this Twitter study of millions of Twitter feeds. They found, not to mention our president's Twitter feeds, um, <laughs> that especially anger is the, are the ones that are the most uh, toxic. If you say, I feel deprived because I can't eat everything I want, that's not sustainable. If you say, I'm choosing not to eat certain foods so that I can live longer to dance with my you know, daughter at their wedding or watch my kids grow up or whatever it happens to be, if you imbue those choices with meaning, then they're, they're, they're powerful. And choosing not to do something that you could otherwise do imbues those choices with meaning. It completely reframes them from feeling deprived. You know, um, Ramakrishna was an a, a ancient saint 100 years ago who was talking about choosing a guru, but it can be like choosing a life partner. You can dig a lot of shallow wells and never reach water. You could just commit to one and you reach the wellspring. Being in a committed monogamous relationship, is that the, the ball and chain or is that, okay, I'm choosing to be with this one person so I can create this, this crucible of sacred safety so that we can progressively open our hearts to each other. And the more intimate you are, the more erotic it becomes and the more fun it becomes. And so instead of having the same kind of experience with a lot of different people, it's like having these infinitely variable experiences with the same person. It completely reframes that and it's like, oh, this is not something to be deprived about. This is something to be joyful about. This is what enables me to really um, have the most special, the most fun, the most joy by making it sacred in this way. I know, I'm, I'm almost done. So um, it, it, it's, it's you know, asking people, why do you want to live longer? And if you can tap into that, it's healing because it's not just how long. You know, when I was depressed, I could take all the meaning out of everything. That's how I got interested in this when I was in college. But I learned that I can also imbue those choices with meaning and then that makes them sustainable because if it's meaningful, it's sustainable. And, and intimacy is healing. And if it's pleasurable, it's sustainable. And to have that double vision, which uh, Swami Satchitananda talked about, that on one level we're separate, on another level we're part of something larger that connects us all. And on the other hand, you know, as Michael said, once you, and, and Toby, once you define someone as being different than you, then they're the other, then you can do bad things to them, those Mexican rapists, those Muslims, those whatever. Okay, so to me, the essence of healing is to see that person as being not different, but that, that you in another form, that double vision. You know, the Swami was always talking about how we're born fine and then we define ourselves by getting stuck in all these definitions that make us think we're different from other people. And that all these, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy of altruism, compassion, forgiveness, and love, really come from that direct experience of interconnectedness. And that's what frees us. Uh, I'm just going to skip, sorry. And uh, it's my uh, little girl, just the, the, the spirit of joy that these kinds of things bring. And that we can help people, you know, as Rachel Remen would say if she were here, uh, to use our suffering our, as doorways or as windows to transforming our lives in ways that go beyond uh, just, you know, the physical, but to the, the, the psychosocial, the emotional, and spiritual. Now, I know I'm, I've used up all my time. I, I have this two-minute video. If you want me to play it, I can. I, I think it's worth it. Uh, this is from, uh, is that okay? I, I'm sorry for, yes. I'm generally pretty, pretty compulsive about time, but I just got a little carried away here. Um, is that um, there's a guy named, uh, he's a four-star admiral, Eric Olson, and he's a guy's guy. You know, he's uh, in charge of uh, all the special forces worldwide. You know, the Navy SEALs, the Army Rangers, Green Berets, Delta Force, et cetera. And I, I figured if I went to the Army War College and I talked about, you know, the power of love at the Army War College, which has a bit of a Dr. Strange love quality to it anyway, um, <laughs> they'd say, oh, you know, you're the worst California doctor. What do you know? But I figured if he did it, it would really change things. And so uh, he made this beautiful video that, um, uh, in which he talks about uh, the power of love that I showed at the Army War College. And let me just uh, play it for you now. Hey, greetings to all of you at Carlisle, I'm Eric Olson. Thank you, Dean, for allowing me to be with you, albeit from a distance. I got to say, Dean, you're the first guy who ever asked me to talk about love. And I got to say that the more I thought about it, the more I was struck by the importance of discussing it, particularly in a military context where it doesn't get talked about often enough. I'm here to say that I believe that love is an under-acknowledged emotion and a force as it relates to military service members and especially soldiers at war. 
but it is certainly a force that drives much individual behavior, and intensely so, in moments of victory or defeat, life or death. Most of us will readily admit to loving many people and things in our lives. Who and what we love is a big part of who we are. But few of us are ready to talk about love as a defining element of ourselves when we are under pressure, when emotions are raw and character can't be faked. Instead, we use other words. We talk about bonding about the brotherhood or sisterhood of arms, or the glue that holds a small unit together when things look very bad. But when everything is on the line, when decisions and actions come more from the heart and gut than from the brain, based on instinct, character, and emotion, the power of love dominates. It crushes caution and fear. Love of purpose and of the opportunity to do what you have trained so hard to do Love for the people you depend on and who depend on you matter the most. I'm not recommending that you go around talking about how much you love each other. I'm only suggesting that we individually recognize that love is a powerful motivator and one that we should let roam freely inside each of us. I wish all of you great success. And again, Dean, thank you for allowing me to be with you. And beautiful, the power of love dominated, crushes caution and fear. And so I just want to end by saying that what Michael and Toby have brought us here together and over the last 40 years, what their respective works have done is to really shine a bright light in the darkness. And love, the light always drives out the darkness, but it has to be a bright light. And I know all of you here are bright lights. And now uh, it's our time to really shine brightly. So thank you for the chance to be here today. Wow. Dean has given us so much. Dean, thank you so much for this. Um, you'll all remember different things from that very compact uh, and full talk, but uh, I just want to point out a few things. One is that while Dean's study was of prostate cancer, uh, his, there were slides in there that talked about colon, prostate, and breast cancer, all right? And so just think about that if you're in the cancer world. And more broadly, because it relates to so many other conditions, um, just reflect on what we've heard about the power of eating well, moving well, stressing less, loving well, four simple, simple things that are at the heart of the Cancer Help Program, the heart of Dean's work, and uh, the heart of a great deal of the work that we all do. Um, the other, a couple of other things I just want to pick up from this, that telomeres can actually lengthen, that brain function can actually improve, that no matter what age you are, it depends on how intensively you do this as opposed to your age. And above all, that the perception of stress is more important than the stress itself. That two people in similar situations with different perceptions, and just think about what that means. You know? Just think about what that means. And finally, on the power of love and intimacy, you know, many of us, when we hear about that, think that that means uh, an erotic partner. But I just want to say to you all that, uh, and I know Dean feels this too, that the power of friendship is equally great. That in, in ancient traditions, that friendship was actually the deepest form of love. And so um, if some of you are feeling that you don't have that intimate partner in the sense of a husband or wife or erotic partner. I just think recognizing that the power of friendship is, is unbelievably powerful. It can also be for community, for the spiritual, for anything that takes us out of our isolation.